Produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Industry on Parade calls on a Tulsa company, Century Geophysical Corporation, whose scientists use the entire world as their laboratory. Not just the surface of the world, but even more, the strata of rock, clay, and gravel buried beneath it. The instruments being assembled and inspected here are galvanometers, one of the basic tools employed by those scientists. Galvanometers make possible the photographing of even the faintest sound waves or vibrations passing through the earth. And this is the camera in which they take those pictures. In exploring for oil, water, natural gas, or even just the best place to build a new highway or tall building, experts like these will be exploded to create the sound waves whose passage through the earth is to be photographed. But before the seismographic tests are made, another crew pulls up to take advantage of that hole in the ground by lowering a Geiger counter into it to see what the uranium prospects are in the neighborhood. This probing device measures underground radioactivity which will be automatically recorded in much the same way as the sound waves are, thus creating a pattern which allows geophysicists to prepare an underground map of the region. Whether the primary goal of the exploration is oil, gas, or water, uranium is almost always worth keeping as a secondary target. For if you hit it in any quantity, it's secondary no more. While the gamma ray measurements are being made, preparations proceed for taking seismographic readings. Geophones are distributed over the area under study. These will pick up the sounds of the blast as transmitted directly through the ground and as reflected off bedrock below. There's the blast. The sound waves have been picked up from a dozen geophones or more. And in a few minutes, the wavy lines that tell the story are ready for examination. Each wiggly line is the report from one geophone. Cursory examination in the field is valuable, but the really important results show up only when the findings of many surveys have been put together in a map that shows up underground contours and formations as revealingly as an X-ray. Just one reason why we can count on oil and mineral reserves far greater than those already being tapped, even though the reserves have not yet been discovered. We know they are going to be discovered. Today, America's leaders of 1976 are studying in our high schools and colleges, learning what America has been, what it is now, and what it can become. The responsibility that falls on every teacher's shoulder is enormous. Industry believes each citizen should do what he can to lighten that load, to support and encourage the teacher in America, to be an active and sympathetic friend of education. Industry itself realizes its own obligations, more visibly and effectively each year, industry is becoming both the willing and welcome ally of education. Tons of fish being unloaded at a northwest port. Fishermen on all three coasts are busier these days, thanks largely to a new development at plants like that of Columbia River Packers Association at Astoria, Oregon. The development Another product of industrial research is the fish steak, a uniform boneless segment of fillet, all battered, breaded, cooked and frozen, ready for easy, odorless heating and serving. Blocks made up of layers of frozen fillets are fed into a power saw that slices them into neat, conveniently sized portions. The sticks are coated with batter, breadcrumbs and seasoning automatically. In recent years, the nation's fishing industry has known some very bad times, but processes like this have brought amazing recovery and also have stabilized employment. Since the fillets, frozen as they're caught, can be processed the year round. Now the fish sticks must be thawed out, pre-cooked before the actual frying in vegetable oil. The pre-cooking is accomplished by infrared heat. As they emerge from the pre-cooker, 
the trays of sticks are placed in a frying rack. Here again, automatic controls take over to ensure giving the fish just the right degree of cooking. It's interesting to note that Easterners prefer their fish to be quite a bit darker than do Westerners, who generally go for a light golden color. Processors of meat, coffee, and many other food products contend with the same regional preferences, and you can be sure they keep those preferences always in mind. For the Midwest, so many seconds of cooking. For the Deep South, something quite different. After cooking, the fish sticks are weighed and packaged. This woman used to count on only a few months' work a year. Now, her employment depends on demand for the product rather than the season. The packages are wrapped and labeled. The fish now will be quick frozen for the second time, but this time they'll stay that way until they're removed from the carton in somebody's kitchen. Emerging from the freezer, the cartons are ready for shipment to whatever part of the country is waiting to receive them. And that could mean any part of the country. For this is one good idea that has spread from coast to coast, bringing better eating and more convenient cooking to homes everywhere and greater prosperity to the fishing industry. A Kansas farmer enlarging a pond on his property. Or perhaps he's digging an irrigation ditch. Whatever he's doing now, in a couple of hours you might find him digging post holes with the same tractor, or mowing grass, or rolling a driveway, or sinking a trench. Obviously, this backhoe rig won't dig post holes or mow grass, but the up-to-date farmer these days has other easily installed attachments that will. It's the big thing in farm machinery, all in one units, that can handle just about any job without sending the farmer into bankruptcy buying the many different machines he could use. Midwestern Industries Incorporated of Wichita is a firm that's riding this new trend toward greater and greater versatility for basic farm tools. They put out a tractor unit they call the Pit Bull. It can accommodate 11 different attachments for 11 different types of jobs. In order to make it possible for a man working alone to change over from one attachment to another, the equipment utilizes the hollow box frame method of fabrication. This gives tremendous strength and durability with a minimum of weight. Incidentally, this same technique has been adopted in the manufacture of other products, like automobiles, with amazing results. Studies have shown that the greatest load on a steel arm like this is sustained by the outer surface. The center core contributes comparatively little, so they eliminate the core along with its weight and expense. The equipment is prepared for shipment, not only to farmers, but to highway departments, general contractors, park commissions, mining companies, and other organizations that are also on the lookout for versatility in their equipment. Versatility like this, the backhoe has become a trench digger. Still the same tractor, same power unit, but an entirely different job. The buckets, which can range from eight inches in width to 16 inches, deposit the soil on a conveyor belt for delivery to either side. Now it's a loader, another attachment, another function. Old Dobbin, the farm horse, used to handle a lot of chores too. He pulled the plow and the cedar and the mower and took the family to church on Sunday. But he didn't bulldoze or roll a surface hard and smooth or tackle many of the other assignments his successor handles with ease. On modern farms, as in modern factories or mines, Men and horses let machines do the really heavy work.
We Americans are always trying to find better ways of doing things. Our forefathers, who pioneered and discovered new frontiers in this country, have been supplanted by the scientists and technicians in American industry's laboratories. Every day, every week, every year, someone is discovering a new product or improving an old one which will benefit all of us. Each year, industry spends more than two and a half billion dollars in research that creates new jobs, more and better products, which help all of us to continually improve our standard of living. One of the largest office buildings in the world pushes up to take its place in the New York skyline. Covering more than two acres of real estate, an entire city block, the structure will tower 45 stories above Manhattan's 42nd Street. Obviously, many varied skills go into the erection of such a building, although metal worker Paul Starr was forgetting some of his skill when he neglected to wear his goggles while center punching a rivet hole. Now, with a splinter of steel in his eye, he calls on the talents of a couple of other participants in this huge construction project, the team of registered nurses who have their headquarters in this specially built Mobile First Aid Station. In a matter of minutes, Paul's eye will be attended to by Nurse Terry Bonin, while her associate, Alice Scott, takes care of another man's injured hand. As the work outside proceeds, the clinic in a trailer can be quickly shifted around as necessary from one part of the building site to another. Meanwhile, Terry and Alice go right on helping to make this construction job one of the safest as well as one of the biggest. With his eye all bandaged, Paul won't be able to work anymore today, but the prompt attention he received will actually mean a minimum loss of time and income. Here, far above the street, we find Alice, checking up on a couple of her outpatients, who seem reluctant to drop by the first aid station unless they're in actual pain. The men get quite a kick out of seeing Alice and Terry up here where few women ever tread. But to tell the truth, they're very proud of these gals. Now industrial safety reaches even way up into the sky.